नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंगिंग यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस principal objective in their aim india's grand strategy of course was the speedy liberation of bangladesh months before mrs gandhi met bhutto at simla this aim had been achieved on the 16th december bangladesh became independent was liberated before simla the majority of uh, of nations had recognized bangladesh and bangladesh was an established fact what simla addressed really was a secondary aim that w- that was evolved during the course of the december war and that was to 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 substitute the uh, the un mandated 1949 ceasefire line which came into effect after Uh, UN Security Council resolution to get rid of that and to shift to a bilaterally agreed line of control which reflected the ground realities of uh, 1971 of December 1971 India and Bangladesh achieved a historic victory in the 1971 war yet 50 years later important questions remain about india's aims and policies in the war drawing on previously unexplored indian records eminent diplomat and historian ambassador chandrashekhar das gupta in this conversation with ambassador nirupama menon rao dispels many myths as he sheds fascinating new light on these and other questions through his new book india and the bangladesh liberation war deeply researched over 18 years this authoritative lucid and compellingly narrated book also reveals why and how india fashioned an overarching grand strategy employing every instrument of national power political diplomatic economic and military to help the bangladesh freedom fighters speedily liberate their country this episode is an extract from a bic streams event that took place on 20th Jan 2022 and now over to ambassador Manan Rao thank you uh, if i may thank you lekha uh, let me add my words of warm welcome to a respected and very distinguished senior colleague ambassador chandrashekhar das gupta and congratulate him for this most noteworthy and incisive account of the liberation of bangladesh and how india's grand strategy as lekha just referred to it and as he terms it won the peace the historian shrinath raghavan in his review of india and the bangladesh liberation war which is the book we are discussing today says most aptly that ambassador das gupta is not only a distinguished diplomat but also an accomplished diplomatic historian his earlier book on the kashmir conflict of 1947-48 remains a definitive work many years after it was published this latest book too i'm sure will be equally definitive and referenced by scholars and the lay audience alike commanding the field as shrinath has said for many decades to come because it is both thorough and insightful ambassador das gupta you served in bangladesh as a young diplomat very soon after the war of liberation and the establishment of the young republic tell us briefly of your impressions on coming to a nation that had just emerged from conflict and was still struggling to recover from the cruelty of the unspeakable crimes committed by the pakistani military junta and to this let me add another question was this a book that you had wanted to write even at that early juncture and uh, is it true that it took 18 years uh, in writing the floor is yours ambassador in the first place thank you very much for your kind words uh, Uh, of introduction very generous words and they mean a great deal to me coming as they do from you um 
Regarding your questions, uh, I think this Bangladesh posting was, uh, I, I arrived uh, shortly after independence. Uh, it, it was the, uh, the, the most uh, exciting uh, sort of posting I've had in my, I had in my career in the foreign service. Most exciting and the busiest posting that I've had. We literally worked from early morning till late at night and uh, then rested for a few hours and came back. We worked seven days a week. We were told not to take our families along with us. And to be present at the creation, as it were, of the new uh, nation state was, uh, was a great experience. Regarding your other question, whether I had intended to write the book at that time, the frank answer is no. Actually, what I had wanted to work at that time was, uh, you know, was one day to look into the uh, into the Bangladesh independence struggle, a history of Bangladesh, rather than India's involvement in the liberation struggle at a, at a later date. But it was uh, later in my career that I came to be interested in the, you know, in the way in which war and diplomacy, defense and defense policies are interconnected and the way in which the international environment and the power of a nation itself, you know, influences this. And that's what caused me to write my first book, which you mentioned, a War and Diplomacy in Kashmir. And, uh, uh, and well, this is, is another step in that direction. So that's how the book came to be written. And when it says, you say 18 years, it's true in a chronological sense, but then I was doing other things as well in these 18 years. It's not that I was spending all my time on the book. Uh, I was involved in the, um, in the climate change negotiations for, for about a decade. And uh, I, I, I had some involvement in UN uh, human rights activities as a member of the UN uh, Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights for 12 years. So uh, it, it was not a full-time, but a part-time occupation, but something that kept me entertained all these 18 years. The book itself is an account ambassador of the eight to nine months from the spring of 1971 till the victory achieved by the Indian and Bangladesh forces in the December of that year. Now, the war itself, as we all know, was a brief war. And as you have said, this is not a book about the military operations of the Indian army, but it is the lead up to the events of December that your narrative focuses on. You mentioned early in your book that your extensive study of the archives revealed that as early as April to May 1971, India had formulated a comprehensive outline plan or grand strategy encompassing military, diplomatic and domestic initiatives with the aim of bringing the uh, independence or liberation war to a successful conclusion before the year end. Now, grand strategy, as one analyst observed not long ago, is the Humpty Dumpty word, recalling what Lewis Carroll wrote in Through the Looking Glass when he has Humpty Dumpty saying that when he uses a word, it means just that just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. How do you define grand strategy? And secondly, was India's grand strategy in 1971 something that evolved in response to other actors, in this case, Pakistan or the United States or even China, implementing their own countervailing strategies? I presume that our purpose was to wrest the maximum advantage from the situation and build our preferred future, which was the end of Pakistani sovereignty over the territory, which is now Bangladesh, and to proceed in a deliberate, almost sequential manner to achieve our aims on the diplomatic, political and security fronts. 
Now, such unity of vision between different wings of government, as we well know, is not easily accomplished in normal situations. For instance, you speak of how the initial, in the initial stages, there was a difference of perspectives between the Ministry of External Affairs and the Intelligence Agency, the Research and Analysis Wing, or the RAW, RNAW as we know it, on how we should approach the deteriorating situation in the erstwhile East Pakistan. So I just thought I'd lay this out a little for your response and your... Thank you. Uh, actually, uh, if that, that quotation from Lewis Carroll is very apt because the term grand strategy has been defined in various ways. And that's why I take some care in this book to, uh, to define it the way that, uh, that, that I want, uh, which is... Uh, you know, the way in which defense, foreign and domestic policies are shaped and integrated to achieve a clearly defined political aim. Uh, it's the way in which all the elements of national power are brought together to achieve a, an overarching aim. Now, the term has also been used, grand strategy, in different ways, you know, and uh, many others, for example, I've used it to mean a long-term strategy, something stretching over, say, 50 years and so on and so forth for building up one's uh, national strength or achieving an economic target, etc. That's why I took care to define the term as I meant it. Some have described this as an all-of-government approach. That's another way of putting it, but um, it means much the same thing. You said, you know, how other countries reacted to it, how we took into consideration. So this, the grand strategy that uh, we evolved during the course of April and May was flexible and it had to adjust to a diplomatic revolution that occurred midway, namely the breakthrough in US-China relations and the emergence of some sort of a, a quasi-alliance between the United States, China, and Pakistan over this issue. It had to have that flexibility, but we never saw lost sight of the principal objective. And the principal objective, as you said, was to ensure the speedy victory of the Bangladesh freedom struggle. Because we feared that if there was protracted chaos a drawn out guerrilla war in East Pakistan, it would spill over to, uh, to, to India, to adjacent areas in India. Now, this seems a little strange today, but, but we must remember that uh, in 1971, West Bengal was still coping with very serious uh, Naxalite problem, and not just West Bengal, other parts of India also. And therefore, this fear that our internal security and stability would be affected was the determining factor, the principal factor in our decision to intervene. I'm not going into whether this was a correct uh, sort of assumption or not. You know, uh, this, uh, I don't think there's much point in, uh, uh, in um, uh, attempting a contrafactual exercise. This was the element. And as you rightly said, there was a, an ongoing debate between uh, Raw and the Ministry of External Affairs uh, on what we should do, given the chances of Pakistan breaking up. Raw had alerted government as early as April 1969 that Pakistan was likely to break up, that the discontent in East Pakistan, what was then East Pakistan, uh, and the, the strength of public support for the six-point movement launched by, by Mujib was so strong that the Pakistan authorities would bring in the army to crush this, that at that point, the East Bengal regiment would uh, take up arms in support of the our only course, the, the um, autonomy course, and the civil war would break out. And incidentally, it wasn't only the draw which came to this assessment. The CIA also formed a similar assessment. Right. Less pointed, less precise, but they also you know, came to this conclusion. Absolutely. 
And then we had this problem, what do we want to do? The foreign ministry, the external affairs ministry felt that our, that what they were hoping for is a transition to democracy in Pakistan. You had this election of December 1970, which gave the Awami League an overwhelming majority in the Pakistan National Assembly. And uh, we were hoping that the Awami League would form a government at the center in Pakistan. And that offered the only hope of a breakthrough in Indo-Pakistan relations as a whole. Uh, and there was sympathy for this also in the, uh, in the prime minister's office. The secretary to prime minister, Haksa, was himself a foreign service officer. Uh, and he uh, was in sympathy with this view. So we were hoping for a transition to democracy rather than a breakup of Pakistan. That's right. And uh, these hopes, um, you know, uh, we had to sort of give up on the 25th March, 1971, when the military regime in Pakistan launched a vicious crackdown. Absolutely. But when you mention, you know, the differences in opinion between the uh, various wings of government, one has to also, um, you know, it's remarkable that Mrs. Gandhi had this kind of A team around her. Uh, yeah. People like Mr. Haksar, Mr. D.P. Dhar, Mr. T.N. Cole, Mr. Ashok Ray, who was the Joint Secretary uh, on the desk. That was certainly an asset when it came to the formulation of the strategy that uh, we adopted. The other comment, uh, you know, that I, I sort of uh, wanted to make was, uh, in, a, in this country, we often forget that the victories of 1971 were not just military ones, but also diplomatic. Absolutely. Yeah. And, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And one interesting aspect also is how in that era of global politics, the principles of non-interference in internal affairs and the territorial integrity of states were so deeply embedded in international law and practice. Now, the principle of humanitarian intervention, as you point out, gained widespread acceptance only after the end of the Cold War, when the U.S. enjoyed unparalleled supremacy. And you say that, and I quote, in order to appreciate the magnitude of the political challenge we faced in 1971, we must recall that since the end of World War II, no secessionist movement had succeeded in breaking up a sovereign state, unquote. So it's interesting how India was able to move, you know, in that given all these formidable obstacles in the terrain that she faced at that time. And also to move from appealing to the international community against the violation of human rights and democratic principles in East Pakistan to questions of peace and security and the need to prevent Pakistan from exporting its domestic problems to India. So, you know, we were able to put forward a definition of aggression and self-defense to include indirect aggression, resulting from the flow of millions of Bangladeshi refugees into India because of Pakistani atrocities against them. So this I thought was something that, you know, any student of international affairs today uh, would find quite remarkable. Yes, I think it was very interesting and, uh, and uh, hats off to those in the Ministry of External Affairs who developed this new concept. Yes. That, you know, this had ceased to be a purely an internal affair of uh, a, a problem of Pakistan's because Pakistan had quote unquote exported this problem to yes. India was, uh, uh, was uh, posing a threat to India's own security. Yes. And uh, we used this in uh, the debate in the UN Security Council when the war broke out. Yes. Absolutely. And the other point of interest was how the whole diplomatic campaign we launched evolved, how, was, how world opinion was mobilized. Because we know that the attitude of governments like the United States uh, were not sympathetic. We didn't get a good hearing from, from the US government, but we had mega stars in the Western world, like George Harrison, John Lennon, Bob mm -hmm. Dylan, Joan Baez, appealing for this for support for Bangladesh. And so this was this what Srinath Raghavan again calls this transnational 
humanism right. that somehow came to the surface and was a kind of force multiplier for us uh, in a sense when it came to world opinion. Tremendous. Uh, and, and this wasn't simply official initiatives. This uh, concept for Bangladesh was an initiative taken by a private Indian citizen, Ravi Shankar. Yes. To yes. begin with. Uh, and there were many, many other Indians who contributed. Uh, who were not in government, even people yes. like Jayaprakash Narayan, who was an uh, opponent of the government, but yes. he uh, you know, played a major part in uh, educating international opinion on the Bangladesh issue. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember I was in college myself at that time and how taken one was with you know what was happening in Bangladesh uh, and politically, diplomatically. We, I mean, I was just a bystander, but I remember those days very, very clearly. Before I turn uh, to issues like the Indo-Soviet relationship, I thought we should discuss the India-US equation or lack thereof during the period under discussion. Now, President Nixon, Richard Nixon, we know harbored deep grudges against Indira Gandhi, often using unprintable language against her, as we all know. And Nixon didn't want to squeeze the Pakistani supremo Yahya Khan because of the opening to China, as you mentioned, and Pakistan's role as the bridge uh, to Beijing. Now, the opening to China was, as you mentioned, Kissinger's geopolitical revolution. And uh, you speak at one stage of Kissinger's parsimoniousness with the truth in recounting the flow of developments on Bangladesh in his memoir, The White House Years. As it turned out, there were deep-seated flaws in the geopolitical outlook of the United States when it came to judging India on the liberation of Bangladesh. And it can be safely said now that America was on the wrong side of history as far as these developments were concerned. And I'm sure our audience will be interested in listening to your uh, recapitulation and your views on this issue. I, I think, um, you know, US public opinion was very different from the views of the White House, I mean, the positions taken by the White House. Yes. And even in the State Department, uh, at working levels, not perhaps at the senior most levels, there was a great deal of sympathy for the Bangladesh cause, which is why we saw a steady leak of secret documents to the, uh, to the US right. press at that time. Uh, well, when I say that he was economical with the truth, for example, he made a big issue of this point that India had major territorial ambitions in the West, yeah. uh, in West Pakistan, and that was not true. We told them several times that we have no territorial intentions regarding West Pakistan. Kashmir was, of course, uh, a different question because, uh, 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 because we don't regard it as part of West Pakistan. But then he never raised this question with the Pakistanis. After all, I mean, it was well known that Pakistan's strategy, military strategy, was to strike in Jammu and Kashmir. That is where you know they would uh, their response would come. Yet this question whether they had any ambitions in Kashmir were never raised, and that is why we didn't provide an, a direct answer to the Americans. But we did, in fact, uh, tell the Americans privately what uh, our intentions were regarding Kashmir. On the twelfth December, our Foreign Secretary T. N. Cole told Ambassador Bush in the UN that we intend to make minor modifications uh, in the ceasefire line, but this will be bilaterally agreed with Pakistan. We don't intend to impose a right. settlement. So right. this is very clear. And Bush immediately reported this to the White House, and we know that Kissinger saw this because the same day he put up a memorandum to the president uh, over his signature. And he summarizes it very, very accurately, what, uh, what Bush was told. And yet in the memoirs, you find no mention of this, but this is only one instance. And uh, there are many other instances where, uh, you know, his, uh, his memoirs are not consistent with the, with the record. 
And, uh, you know, talking about the China factor in this context, uh, the White House believed that China would very likely come to Pakistan's aid through action against India on our common borders. But that did not take place. In fact, you mentioned the Chinese leadership's response to American overtures about supporting China in the event of the latter attacking India, since maximum intimidation of the Indians was needed. In fact, when the Chinese were informed that the US had a fundamental interest in maintaining China's viability, Mao Zedong is believed to have said, why should our viability become China's concern? I mean, I think thereby hangs a tale also. This whole question of Chinese involvement Precisely. coming to Pakistan's aid. Precisely. You are quite right, you know. I mean, there are authors, I won't sort of name them, who think that actually the White House strategy was quite right because China was a more important factor in US calculations than India. I think they missed the point that the White House misread the Chinese position. Uh, they weren't looking for an American umbrella against yes. uh, Soviet attack. They were not prepared to subject the defense of China to, uh, you know, to, to an American nuclear umbrella. Yes. Uh, and I think this was a major miscalculation. Absolutely. Of course, you. this is not something um, addressed or covered in your book, but why do you think the Chinese decided against any overt uh, support, uh, military support to Pakistan at that time? Was it because of internal political factors? Was it because of their difficulties already, uh, rather deep difficulties with the, with the Soviets? Or was it because they were already, I mean, uh, there were signs that, a thaw was beginning in India-China relations at that time, or at least some overtures were being considered from both sides. In fact, Mrs. Gandhi had spoken about it in 1969 when she said we were prepared to talk to the Chinese. And then, of course, in 1970, you had the famous Mao smile and handshake with Brajesh Mishra at the October parade. So I'm just wondering, I'm trying to read, uh, you know, the significance of the Chinese actions. No, you are, you are quite right. In point of fact, during the course of the war, Mrs. Gandhi did write to Juan Lai, yes. uh, you know, explaining India's intentions and assuring her that, you know, there's nothing which affected Chinese interests and so on. Now, having said that, I frankly do not know uh, why, uh, China did not intervene. It's possible that uh, they considered that it would be uh, unfractuous, that they wouldn't be able to uh, bring adequate pressure against India. After all, in December, the, uh, the passes, the Himalayan passes were icebound and access would be slow. But I, and I should mention that there was a briefing given during the war when the defense secretary, K.B. Lal, was asked by a journalist, you know, what um, China's position was. And K.B. Lal remained silent for about uh, 30 seconds. And then he said, you know, looking upwards at the ceiling, he said that I think both sides, India and China, are praying that the passes will be impossible. <laughs> impossible, you know, something of that. Yes, yes. So, so the winter, uh, the winter factor. The winter factor. Yeah, the, the, the winter factor. Yes. So it could be that it could be that they had a more sophisticated understanding of the situation on the ground in, uh, in East Pakistan than uh, their public statements would suggest. I don't know whether this is true, but I mention this because. You know, the Pakistan ambassador in Beijing at that time was from East Bengal, Ambassador Kaiser. And his second in command, Councillor Rubedullah Khan, was also uh, from East Bengal. And certainly the latter, I do not know about the ambassador, but was, was in touch with our uh, sort of people. Right. Now, when a Pakistan delegation, a senior delegation visited there, uh, this is the account of the Pakistan Foreign Secretary at that time, in his memoirs he says, 
that uh, they were received by Zhou Enlai very warmly. And then at midnight, Zhou Enlai paid them a visit. You know, they were sort of startled to see yes. And uh, at, at the guest house where, you know, Kaiser was not present. He was <laughs> asleep in bed. Yes. And Zhou Enlai told them that, uh, you know, Ambassador Kaiser is from the East and I wanted to spare him any embarrassment he might feel. And then he proceeded to you know, have a discussion with them before the formal discussions the next day when yes. Kaiser was present. So this suggests that, you know, you had some inkling of what was going on. I don't know. I'm only guessing. Right. But I, I don't know the Chinese position. But. Absolutely. The archives, of course, are closed. There may be diplomatic memoirs that speak to this, but that has to be the subject of another uh, investigation. I thought I'd come now, Ambassador, to the signing of the Indo-Soviet uh, Peace and Friendship Treaty, which was a watershed development in a watershed year for India. Yeah. Now, you write of how Mrs. Gandhi took her time to move forward in concluding this treaty, grappling with the prospect of how it would impact our non-aligned posture, for instance, or also perhaps because she didn't wish to entirely jettison or at least adversely impact ties with the West. I mean, it speaks volumes of for Mrs. Gandhi, I think. But both the Soviets and the Indians drew closer together as Pakistan spurned Soviet urging to resolve problems with the Awami League and Sheikh Mujibur Rahman peacefully, and as the Americans made it known to India that they would essentially sit back and watch the show if the Chinese were to attack India in the event of hostilities with Pakistan. So uh, could you speak about the whole impact of Soviet support for India during this crucial period, especially now when India-Russia relations are in quite a different place, I'm afraid, uh, both bilaterally and in the United Nations. I refer to the Soviet support at that time. And also, what was the impact of the signing of the treaty on India's efforts to assist Bangladesh and its freedom fighters in their struggle for self-determination and independence? What the Indo-Soviet Treaty provided was first deterrence against, uh, you know, a move to deter Chinese intervention right. in a South Asian conflict. That was, I think, the principal thing. It also gave us an assurance that military supplies, supplies of military equipment, would arrive in a timely way. Uh, of course, we had an ongoing military supply relationship with the Soviet Union, but these demands were vastly increased. And not only increased, they were brought forward in time. Deliveries which were meant to be affected in 72 or even 73 were brought forward. And heavy equipment was often airlifted, so they arrived in time. So the assured military supplies, uninterrupted military supplies, we also discussed with them as soon as the treaty was signed, in fact, the day after the treaty was signed, the question of oil supplies during a crisis. What if there was the, the Middle Eastern suppliers, I mean, those who were friendly with Pakistan, uh, decided to stop uh, oil supplies to India? And we suggested that since the Soviet Union had an ongoing relationship with Iraq, which included purchases of Iraqi oil, these purchases could be diverted to India. It didn't actually happen, but uh, precautionary steps. What we didn't get from the Soviets immediately was an assurance of support in the event of a direct Indian military intervention on the Bangladesh side. The Soviets were prepared to turn a blind eye, as it were, to the assistance that we were given to the Bangladesh freedom fighters, but they didn't want to see direct Indian military involvement in that. And this was the object of Mrs. Gandhi's visit to Moscow in late September. We knew that the Soviets had this sort of more or less inflexible stand on uh, interference in the internal affairs of another country. We explained our position to them that the Pakistanis are exporting the refugee problem. They listened to it, but it didn't actually move them. 
we, uh, somebody, I think it was D.P. Dhar, who first got this sort of notion that we have to present this as a war of national liberation, a cause which is justified in Soviet eyes. And therefore, he flew down to, to Kolkata, met the Mujib Nagar authorities. He knew that Tajuddin had wanted to form some sort of a united front with the pro-communist, uh, with the pro-Soviet uh, Communist Party, uh, the pro-Soviet uh, NAP, and he encouraged them. And therefore, this, this, uh, these elements were taken into the government and some sort of a united front was formed. He uh, then presented this to the Russians as a yeah. case of, uh, you know, as a national liberation war. And Mrs. Gandhi tried to sell this. Uh, the Soviet leadership was half convinced because at the end of the discussions, Brezhnev said, uh, agreed that there were some elements of a national liberation war in this. And uh, but Gorni also nodded assent. Interestingly, Kasigan remained silent. I think he was the last to be convinced. And uh, at the end of this visit, there was a joint communique which spoke of East Bengal for the first time, but only in the English version. The Russian version still had East Pakistan. So the Soviets had been moved, I mean, had shifted their position but not fully. And it was only at the end of November, after Yahya Khan had brushed aside the suggestion from the Soviet president that the whole talks, discussions with the army league, that, uh, that the Soviets assured us of full support in, at the United Nations. And which really, which really, the veto such a difference. It's all important. It's very, I mean, that whole, turn of events so dramatic, even when you read it today, uh, it's really quite, uh, quite gripping. Uh, I thought we'd uh, also turn to the issue of Pakistan more centric, in a more centric fashion, and the Simla agreement, which happened after Bangladesh had been liberated, I mean, a few months later. Now, there's a tendency in India, as we all know, to dwell on what is perceived as our quote unquote failure to secure a lasting settlement on Kashmir at Simla, since we were the victors of the 1971 war and our return of um, 90,000 Pakistani prisoners of war to Pakistan, many feel was done without a quid pro quo. But your book offers a very clear eyed and incisive account of this chapter in the saga of 1971 and after. Why, for instance, did Indira Gandhi not move ahead to secure a Kashmir settlement? Why did India have no option but to return the POWs? How was the ceasefire line adjusted, as you were saying, or transformed into a mutually agreed line of control between India and Pakistan? How did we achieve the precedence of bilateralism over multilateralism in the settlement of the Kashmir dispute? What really did India want to secure at Simla? What was India's grand strategy at Simla, may I ask? <laughs> so the principal object of India, aim of India's grand strategy, of course, was the speedy liberation of Bangladesh. Months before Mrs. Gandhi met Bhutto at Simla, this aim had been achieved. On the 16th December, Bangladesh became independent, was liberated. Before Simla, the majority of, uh, of nations had recognized Bangladesh and Bangladesh was an established fact. What Simla addressed really was a secondary aim that, that was evolved during the course of the December war. And that was to, to, to substitute the, uh, the UN mandated 1949 ceasefire line, which came into effect after uh, UN Security Council resolution. Uh, to, subs to, to, to get rid of that and to shift to a bilaterally agreed line of control, which reflected the ground realities of uh, 1971, of December 1971. And we conveyed this, as I mentioned earlier, to the Americans. This was part of our efforts to shift 
from a multilateral to a bilateral fora for settlement of, uh, of Indo-Pakistan issues. This is what we wanted really to achieve, to get rid of the UN sort of thing and to, uh, to do this, uh, to, to attempt a settlement of issues bilaterally with Pakistan. And this was what Simla was about. And I think it was, this uh, aim was substantially achieved at Simla. Uh, we did get a line of control, which replaced the old uh, ceasefire line. And we did get a commitment of sorts to bilaterally discuss and resolve other outstanding issues between India and Pakistan including a final settlement of Kashmir. It was never our intention to seek a final settlement of, of the Kashmir issue at Simla, uh, meaning to convert the line of control into a formal international boundary. Mrs. Gandhi feared that, uh, uh, that um, she'd be criticized uh, by the Indian public, that she'd be attacked for having surrendered Pakistan-occupied Kashmir off of that. And therefore, she uh, didn't see this as something which could be immediately achieved. I think this was her long-term goal, and she did uh, you know, point sort of events in that direction. But I don't think uh, it would have been feasible to settle the Kashmir issue once and for all at Simla in 1972, or for that matter, today. Yes. Because even today, you had authoritative statements saying that, you know, we're going to take back the right. uh, Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Exactly. And I don't think the Pakistanis have been ready at any stage to accept that either. So, no. so that I think uh, we tend to delude ourselves that somehow a settlement could be reached on that basis. And frankly, the, PO, the, the POWs, the prisoners of war, could not be used as a bargaining counter in that sense. I mean, this is a gross violation of the Geneva Conventions, of well-established uh, you know, international law. It would not only have earned us uh, you know, criticism, condemnation from the rest of the international community, more importantly, it would have deprived us of the protection of the Geneva Conventions in any future conflict. With any other country, Indian soldiers were taken as prisoners of war. Exactly. It would be an absurd thing to do, particularly given the fact that Manik Shaw repeatedly stated that we would respect the Geneva Conventions, we would respect international law after the uh, Pakistan surrender in East Bengal. Absolutely. I mean, India came out of this, I think, uh, with quite a halo around her head, uh, even today when you think of all the steps that we took. I mean, we were able to uh, enable Bangladesh's freedom. And even with Pakistan, I think, in victory, we were quite gracious, I think. And, and uh, you know, we, we managed to reach uh, some degree of, uh, of uh, mutual agreement, at least as far as, you know, the dividing line that exists to this day in uh, Jammu and Kashmir is concerned between Pakistan and India. So uh, a truly historic moment for Indian foreign policy and Indian statesmanship. And uh, I think truly something that we need to study very closely <laughs> till this day. I think so. And if I may add something about Indian statesmanship, it was a great act of statesmanship on the part of Prime Minister Mrs. Gandhi uh, that she did not present this as a personal victory or as a victory of her party. Right. On 17th December, speaking in Parliament, she thanked the opposition for their understanding and cooperation throughout the war. It was a national success. And she never made this into, uh, uh, you know, into a party or individual sort of uh, yes. thing. And this, I think, was an act of great statement. Mrs. Gandhi never lived to write her own memoirs. I wonder what she would have had to say about, you know, those moments and that period. Because she was 
in fact, praised by Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee that time in the opposition as a Mahisha Sura Mardini, as he called her, I remember. And she truly, uh, nationally, I think, was elevated in many ways to that, that position. Uh, I think uh, now we have, uh, perhaps we should invite the audience uh, to uh, pose some questions. Uh, we have one uh, from uh, uh, Mr. Jairamo, who says, uh, please throw some light on the role of P.N. Haksar, D.P. Dhar, and T.N. Kohl in the drawing up of the liberation uh, strategy. Well, I think uh, uh, they all, each of these three played uh, a crucial role in shaping policy. And we should add to this uh, Mr. Kao, Arun Kao, who was the right. Indian intelligence at that time. They were the principal advisors. Uh, above all, uh, P.N. Haksa uh, had tremendous influence over the course of events, and he was a principal advisor. This Mrs. Gandhi did not blindly follow their advice in all cases. For example, she was the last to hold out on signing and concluding a treaty with the Soviet Union. Uh, because she was concerned about uh, non-aligned image. Even after each of these people, uh, Haksa, Tien Kohl, uh, D.P. Dhar, of course, had uh, been persuaded about the, uh, about the uh, need to sign the treaty, she held out till the last moment when she saw that a new a sort of axis was developing, as it were, between the United States, China, and Pakistan. It was at that point that she gave the go-ahead. So it isn't a case where she blindly followed the advice of a, um, uh, given to her by, uh, by people like Haksa, but uh, the details of policy were shaped by, by Haksa above uh, about everybody else there. And they played a crucial role. Absolutely. And Mr. Jairam Ramesh's book on P.N. Haksar. Yes, yes. that one, yeah. that's a very important book. I yeah. think it's a very important book because uh, Parallel Lives, he calls it. That's right. This book. And it shows, you know, how important the relationship was in 1971. Yes but how it started deteriorating shortly thereafter. Uh, it shows P.N. Haksar, I think, you know, as a person of great uh, moral integrity, because even at the cost of power and influence, he uh, stuck to his beliefs and yes. to his principles. And in that context, talking about this integration and this uh, success uh, with the kind of advice that Indira Gandhi received, uh, there was one uh, uh, portion in your book which talked about coordination between the three services of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, uh, and how we achieved that despite not having an integrated defense structure at that time. And I think this is a valid question even to this day. Uh, credit, you say, is due to the concerned military and civilian officers, but we should not lose sight of the fact that it was possible to put these informal or improvised arrangements in place only because several months were available for preparation for this war. Moreover, the improvisations could not completely close the gaps in coordination caused by institutional deficiencies. Coordination between the chiefs of staff and leading civil servants was mostly affected through informal meetings. The political dimension of policy was often unclear to some others who should have been more fully in the picture. Even the cerebral air chief Lal recalled later that he had doubts in his mind about the objectives of the war. The spectacular military success achieved in 1971 must not obscure the great deficiencies in India's institutional structures, many of which persist to this day. Yes. I think, I mean, Lal was not clear. The air chief was not clear about our strategic objectives. Yes. Also, just to expand on that a little bit, a man like Jacob, 
who held a critically important position during the war as chief of staff in the uh, Eastern headquarters. He, I don't think, grasped the fact, the, the rationale for the operational plans that were drawn up by army headquarters in, uh, at the end of July. Dhaka was not part of the plan. The idea was to occupy most of Bangladesh, leave Dhaka, but secure all the major ports in Bangladesh, Chittagong and you know the other two sort of, and Kulna. The, uh, because we feared that a Security Council resolution might bring hostilities to an end before we had achieved our, the purpose of liberating Bangladesh. Yes. So the idea was more limited. It was to make it impossible for Pakistan to maintain, to keep their hold on Dhaka because the troops could not be replenished or supplied. Yes. Now, these plans were drawn up before the conclusion of the Indo-Soviet Treaty. And we did not have a Soviet assurance regarding a veto till the end of November. It's only in uh, one of the appendices, Appendix 1 of uh, Jacob's book on the war, that there's a sentence you know, uh, in a letter that he writes to Manik Shaw, which says it was only on the eve of the war that army headquarters developed a plan for quote unquote total victory, which means including Dhaka. But this is because there was an assurance of a veto. Yes. So what I mean is, you know, this, this strict compartmentalization of, you know, foreign policy, defense, etc. This uh, is something which we need to, to look at again and to recognize. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, there's a question. You mentioned Field Ma uh, General Manik Shaw, now Field Marshal Manik Shaw. What impact did he have on the whole, uh, you know, this story? You mentioned, I mean, there, I think this was uh, raised in a previous interview you had, that, um, that you know, it, Mrs. Gandhi, of course, uh, listened to Manik Shaw at, at an early stage, and he was counseling perhaps some, you know, patience and some due deliberation before we advanced on the military front. But somehow for, for us to now, with the benefit of hindsight, to say that it was he essentially who kind of masterminded this whole process would be wrong. It's wrong because already, I mean, Haksa had made it very clear. Uh, you know, there's this briefing note that he prepared for Mrs. Gandhi when she met members of the opposition to explain to them that, you know, immediate action by us would be condemned by the international community yes. as interference in Pakistan's internal problems. And the Bangladesh cause would lose all international support and sympathy. It would be counterproductive to move in. Yes. So, of course, uh, I mean, Manik Shaw did give his views and uh, they were accepted by government. But it's not as if he restrained an impatient Mrs. Gandhi from ordering the, the army into Bangladesh at that time. Now, yes. uh, I, I must say that a lot of senior military officers, retired military officers, have, uh, have criticized this uh, statement of mine. They feel that it's an attack on an iconic military figure. And uh, Manik Shaw deservedly is an iconic military figure. You know, he provided inspirational leadership to the army. But he was a human being after all, and like all other human beings, he had his uh, sort of, uh, you know, his, his weaknesses. Uh, and, uh, and he was a bit of a raconteur, and he did tend to, you know, yeah. That these things. Now, I want to read here a very important sort of uh, paragraph yes. from a book on the 1971 war written by Major General Sukhvan Singh in 1980, long before, uh, you know, these uh, sort of debates. Uh, okay. This is the book on the Bangladesh Liberation War. And Sukhvan Singh was the deputy director of military operations. And recounting these events, he says, you know, that Manik Shaw had these sort of, uh, um, had this view that it, the operations could take place only after the monsoons. 
on very sound grounds. But then he goes on to say, and I'm quoting from General Sukhwan Singh's book, political compulsions clinch the issue of tiling. If the creation of an independent Bangladesh was achieved by Indian military action, how was its domestic and external viability to be assured without its recognition by the international forum, the United Nations? If India intervened without clearly justifying the action in foreign eyes, the charge that it was engineering the breakup of Pakistan would be established and Bangladesh would be refused recognition by the majority of nations. The point I'm trying to make is that the, uh, that army headquarters and more specifically the DMO, the Directorate of Military Operations, clearly understood the, that it was the political factor that was the decisive element yes. in government's decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. But unfortunately, we tend to you know, rely on sort of folklore, on gossip, rather than on turning to the records to see what actually happened. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And this observation by Major General Sukhwan Singh is extremely valid. And I think people should, should take that on board. Uh, just as, I mean, just, uh, I, I'm just uh, looking at the uh, list of questions and we've just spent a good 10 minutes in our discussion talking about Pakistan and Simla. And yet, a uh, gentleman has asked the same question about how this was a diplomatic faux pas and how we, uh, we gave up the prisoners. So I would urge the, the, the questioner to please read the records more carefully and not be taken in by stereotypical views of, of what happened. I think we're too governed by these, uh, you know, these uh, views and, and a kind of a stereotype, uh, applying the stereotype uh, to any such thing. It, we didn't wave any white flag of surrender at Simla, we didn't. <laughs> so there are two other questions. Uh, one is from uh, Mr. D.A. Prasanna, and he's not talking about 1971 here. He's talking more about post-independence uh, in Bangladesh and you know the assassination of Sheikh Mujib. And uh, again, uh, the question is, how did we, that is India, let the assassination of Sheikh Mujib to take place? Where did we fail? Uh, I'm not, not an expert on that period, so I don't know whether you could answer that question. Well, ba Bangladesh is an independent state, uh, is an independent country. There's no way in which, uh, I mean, we don't run the affairs of Bangladesh. So exactly. how could we have prevented this? It's only the, the Bangladesh authorities who could have prevented it. But all that we could have, we could do was to to encourage those forces, those elements, those political parties in Bangladesh, which opposed the plotters, you know, who, who uh, assassinated the father of the nation, Mujibur Rahman, and who tried to convert Bangladesh into a military dictatorship on the Pakistan model. Uh, we supported, we continued to support democratic elements in Bangladesh. And uh, that is the, the most that we could have done. And I think what we have today is, uh, you know, the ground that Bangladesh has covered. I mean, the progress it has made. And I think in many ways, it, uh, in South Asia, it has become quite a poster child, I think, for what we can achieve uh, through, uh, through, you know, far-sighted economic policies and more inclusiveness. And, and I think the India-Bangladesh relationship also is, is in a good place. Uh, I think one cannot deny that. Yes, I think, you know, it's, uh, the Indo-Bangladesh relationship is in a good place today. Uh, we should never take that for granted. It's important to keep cultivating these good relations. And, uh, and to ensure that they always remain on an even keel. Absolutely. And, you know, talking about Pakistan and Kashmir, and when one reads your book, uh, one, uh, you know, 
One point that appears many times is that the freedom fighters in Bangladesh, the Awami League, and even you know before Sheikh Mujib, what what Mr. Sorawadi had to say about you know the future of of East Pakistan, uh, the issue of Kashmir, which has been you know this bone of contention between India and Pakistan, was never was never something that figured in the calculus of the Awami League, even when. You know, they were a part of Pakistan when they were, you know, uh, when Bangladesh was still, you know, literally a twinkle in the eye at that time. So uh, it just, uh, you know, I think there also, it's very interesting to see how, you know, the, the um, both these, uh, you know, East and West Pakistan at that time, the fruits of partition and Bangladesh in a sense now, uh, a further, you know, it is, descended from that genealogy in many ways, what happened with partition. But Kashmir has, has never been an issue. You know, a lot of, we say a lot of Muslim countries, Islamic countries have a certain viewpoint about Kashmir and uh, Pakistan tries to, to play that, you know, that drum whenever it can. But in where the Awami League was concerned, this was never, never an issue. No. no. Because it is a secular party. It's been, uh, uh, you know, devoted to the cause of secularism since uh, uh, the uh, Muslim Awami League changed its name to Awami League. That's right. Because originally, you know, it all sort of came out from the Muslim League. And then it became the Muslim Awami League. And then in the early 50s, they dropped in, you know, the, the name Muslim from this because it was meant to be a secular party open to people of all faith. That's right. That's right. That is, and, and you know, uh, I also wanted, uh, you know, the picture on the cover of your book, uh, you know, this, which is also on the poster for today's event. Were you present at this uh, signing of the friendship treaty between India and Bangladesh? Uh, no, I was not present. I was there at that time, but it was a very restricted sort of event. Yes. And our High Commissioner and Deputy High Commissioner were there. I see that Mr. Dixit is here in the picture. Dixit, and between Mrs. Gandhi and Mujib, Yes, the figure with his head down, and that is Subimal Dutt, yes, a high commissioner there. Uh, and he was a, a remarkable man, a man of great integrity, Spartan uh, sort of living you know, lifestyle, would wake up at four every morning, have a cold water bath, uh, get into his sort of dhoti uh, prayers and so on, and um, very, very hard working, you know, even though he was in his 70s at that yes. time. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, he, I mean, he was uh, for foreign secretary during the uh, years when our difficulties with China emerged in the right. late 50s. And uh, right. it's fascinating to listen to his account of those times. And, a bit, and uh, I, I've read somewhere that he was an ICS officer cast in a very different mold, not anglicized, not, you know, that England returned type, but, you know, very no, much a son of the soil. Very much a son of the soil. Uh, and uh, he sat for the ICS exams from India. Yes. He, never, he uh, you know, hadn't been to Britain at that time. He told me once that uh, he was a probationer be out sent. Yes. And in those days, probationers stayed with the collector. And he used to look forward to Be out sent going on tour because then he could get into his dhoti, sit cross legged at the sort of dining table, and <laughs> eat his sort of meal with his fingers. You know? <laughs> Whereas Be out sent would insist on proper attire. That's and, right. And table and you know knives and forks and so on and so exactly on. exactly but uh, he had a, i think it's an unparalleled position powers as head of mission because it was understood that anything approved by him would automatically get financial approval so we didn't wait for financial approval 
if it had the High Commissioner's approval, then that was a decision of government. And I mentioned this sort of instance in my book where, you know, uh, shortly after liberation, there was, uh, you know, fear about a major cholera outbreak in parts of Bangladesh. And this would spread into India because these were the sort of territories on the border. And uh, the Bangladesh authorities did not have the, I do not know the, how many hundreds of thousands of, you know, shots were required vaccination uh, to prevent this epidemic from breaking out. And the High Commissioner decided that these, uh, the, 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 the vaccine should be delivered the entire requisite quality in Dhaka within 48 hours. And I was instructed to ensure that this was done. I was the first secretary. I rang up the undersecretary concerned in, uh, in Delhi, Ranjit Gupta, and said that these are the High Commissioner's instructions. And lo and behold, the supplies arrived within 36 hours two Indian Air Force tran trans transport planes arrived at the airport bearing these uh, the, the vaccines, which they had picked up from some place near Pune. Now, normally this would have taken weeks or even months, That's you know, right. financial approval and then discussions with the between external affairs and the health ministry and then between the health ministry and the air force and okay. we have to pay for what and so on and so forth but all this was done within 36 hours such were the powers which he had uh, we needed money dikshit and i uh, he decided uh, you know should be sent to the chittagong hill tracts to examine the political situation there. We had a helicopter at our disposal in no time. And we flew over to these areas. So it was, you know, incredible. But he was a man of total integrity. And as I said, a Spartan sort of lifestyle. The, he's the only officer I've known in service who actually cut down his foreign allowance. I mean, the inspectors came there. They decided on these allowances. And because of his status there, they decided to share this, <laughs> their recommendations with him. And he said, all right, allow the others, but the high commissioner does not need this much money. And he should be entitled to whatever it was, a measly amount, 30 pounds per month or something like that as mm -hmm. foreign allowance to you know, allow for drinks, et cetera, to be brought in. And before he left Dhaka, he asked Mani Dikshit to sign a piece of paper for the customs duty because he had imported a luxury item, which was a transistor radio. The one thing which he had imported and acquired during his stay as high commissioner in Dhaka, and he produced the receipts, et cetera, and he wanted this certification for customs that Sri Subhimal Dutt, ICS retired High Commissioner of the, for India in Bangladesh, had purchased this through the foreign exchange allotted to him, et cetera, et cetera, and so on, you know, signed Jane Dixit, <laughs> Deputy High Commissioner. I see. I see. You know. <laughs> I see. Yeah. And right about the, uh, please go ahead. Sorry, I didn't want no, to. I said he had, um, uh, at liberation, you know, there was a fund for refugees in India through voluntary contributions. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten, it was something like 10 lakhs, a great deal of money in those days, nothing today, of course. And uh, the government didn't know what to do with this after liberation because the refugees had all gone back. And they decided to, to place these funds at uh, Mr. Dutt's sort of command. You could dispose of it as he thought fit. And he asked the first secretary economic to keep these accounts, you know. So, and there was accounting for every sort of anna that was spent from these funds. I see. And he was not required to report to government. This was only for the, you know, for the high commissioner's own satisfaction that uh, the office kept these records. 
Uh, there is a question uh, saying uh, what uh, was the role of individual, and the question says embassies, and I'm sure the questioner means consulates, uh, in Kolkata, and also the embassies in Delhi, the foreign embassies, uh, have on the diplomatic front uh, during the period of uh, our history here. What role did they play? Let's say the U.S. embassy in Delhi or the Western embassies or... Oh, I see. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, um, our embassies abroad or foreign... No, no, the foreign, the foreign embassies in India. Well, uh, it's a very interesting question. The, I think the Soviet ambassador played a very active role. And he was in touch with the highest authorities in the country throughout the war. Uh, he was also a very important member uh, in the Communist Party hierarchy in the Soviet Union. So he had access to top circles there. The U.S. ambassador <laughs> was, uh, uh, you know, he had deep reservations against his sort of policy. Yes. And uh, uh, he, in fact, uh, towards the end, you know, when the enterprise arrived in the Indian Ocean, he said that yeah, I find it impossible uh, any more to explain, you know, uh, yes. government's policies here. And he was, he said he was inundated with letters from private American citizens saying what the hell is our government doing? Right. So, uh, so he was in a very awkward sort of position. Um, I think these were the two major players uh, involved during the war. Uh, incidentally, after the war, uh, you raised this question of consulates. The Bangladesh consulate in Kolkata played an extremely important role. Even during the liberation struggle, of, uh, of course, uh, uh, they were uh, one of the first, the first mission uh, as a whole, which uh, went over to the to the freedom fighters, yes. the Mujib Nagar government. Um, but after liberation, the Bangladesh Deputy High Commissioner's office in Kolkata actually was larger, had more personnel than the uh, embassy in Delhi. Uh -huh. yeah, it, it, it gives you an idea of how important they consider the connection with West Bengal to be. West Bengal. Uh, in fact, uh, the late Krishna Bose writes in her memoir uh, about uh, the in the summer of 1971 when her husband and she had invited the Pakistani consul general in Kolkata and his family and his deputies for a dinner. And they were all from East Pakistan, these officers and how they sat around after dinner and sang Tagore songs and how there were tears in the eyes of the, uh, these Pakistani diplomats who were actually from Bengal when they sang those Tagore songs and this feeling, you know, of this connection between Bengalis on both sides and uh, respect for a common heritage, you know, which is sometimes so absent in South Asia today. Uh, yes, yes, that's true. That's true. De uh, Gaulle is, uh, I, I think he's remarkable and quite exceptional in the sense that uh, he's the only person I know of who has composed the national anthems of two countries, and I believe has also inspired the national anthem of a third country, Sri Lanka. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. In fact, a lot of Sri Lankan music and uh, has been influenced by uh, India during, uh, you know, our freedom struggle, the music of our freedom struggle, and a lot of Marathi composers have influenced Sri Lankan music, oh, uh, apart see. from, you know, the Bengal connection. So it's it's quite a subject wor wor worthy of study. There was a question about the role of Foreign Minister Swaran Singh, uh, you know, in uh, in. Uh, the history that, that you've written about. I know he figures a lot in the book and he seems to be a very calm and composed interlocutor on every occasion that you write about. But tell us something about, about the man and his role as foreign minister at that time. So that's what I'm saying 
was uh, was a, was a, a remarkable person. I mean, he was always he was unflappable. He was never overexcited. Always great balance. Uh, moderation in his attitude, in his views. On the Bangladesh question, he uh, there's evidence that he had uh, reservations about our policy. Now, what exactly these were, I do not know. But that he had reservations, I do know because in the P. N. Huxer papers, there's a small note from Indira Gandhi in her own handwriting. There's an envelope, and she says, Sri P. N. Haksa, you know, most urgent. And there's a short note in her handwriting saying that uh, about our meeting tomorrow with the Mujib Nagar authorities, I leave it to you to decide whether to, uh, in, to, to invite uh, foreign minister to Swaran Swar Swar Singh. Because uh, of his views, I see. so you know, there's just a little sort of slip of paper with that handwritten. So that suggests that he had other views, but we do not know what they are because he was a loyal member of the cabinet and yes. he followed government policy regardless of whatever reservations he might have had. Uh, I had one final question before we close, Ambassador Daskutta. As far as the archives you consulted were concerned. Uh, do you feel uh, you had you had all the access that you needed, and uh, because there are many, um, I'm sure there there will be many future scholars, uh, academics, uh, even practitioners like us who will uh, want to write about historic events like this, and um, uh, consulting the archives always becomes so vital and so crucially important. Now the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library and all the private papers that are now lodged there have been immeasurably useful uh, to those of us who, who seek to write on such topics. But is can we open the universe a little more, do you think, on these issues? I think it's extremely important. It's extremely important that we do so. I have to say that there has been progress in this direction, considerable progress. Okay. Uh, so far as the Ministry of External Affairs is concerned, we've sent down a lot of pipes to the National Archives, but uh, still much more needs to be done. The thing is that other ministries have to follow suit. And in my opinion, this applies also to the Prime Minister's Secretariat or the Prime Minister's office. These contain some of the most important papers, you know, where policy is making concern. I'm not saying, I mean, we should follow the 30 year rule. Once, you know, a paper is more than 30 years old, it's uh, only the very exceptional document which needs to be, um, you know, to be uh, kept away from, uh, from the okay. public. And we should really sort of do this. And this applies to the defense ministry as well and the home ministry. I believe uh, that you have answered all the questions that came up. And I wanted to thank you for a most uh, enlightening discussion and for answering all the issues that were raised so patiently. Once again, I congratulate you on this book. It's a wonderful read. I certainly enjoyed reading every part of it. And I would would most sincerely and wholeheartedly recommend it to all our audience members today. Please go out and get a copy of the book. And I'm sure it will answer many of the questions that you felt were unanswered all these years, and perhaps also dispel a number of stereotypes that exist in many of our minds when it comes to uh, recounting and recalling the events of, uh, of a very formative period not only in Bangladesh's history, but I believe in our history uh, too. So thank you so much, Ambassador Das Gupta. Thank you so much. Thank you for staying on for the full conversation. If you like what we do, please share it with your friends and family. You can also leave us a review or rating on iTunes and Apple Podcasts. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saranaraj and Raghavendra Tenkaila. Artwork and design is by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. 
Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. Do follow us on Instagram for updates on all our programming. This is Lekha Naidu signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC.